Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you once again for the privilege of coming into your presence to study your love letter to us, your holy word. We ask that as we study about the testimony of Jesus, that you will speak to us through the ministration of your Holy Spirit. Help us to understand, Lord, why you have raised the testimony of, of Jesus in these last days, so that we might be ready for that glorious event that will soon transpire, the coming of Jesus in power and glory. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. This verse is speaking about the end time remnant. And we've studied a few things about this verse, but now we want to take a look at an expression that appears at the very end of this verse. It reads in the following way. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So God's end time remnant will not only keep the commandments of God, not only will they have faith in Jesus, not only will they have the patience of the saints, but they will also have or possess the testimony of Jesus Christ. Of course, the question is, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? I believe that the best way to understand what is meant by this expression is to return to the times of Jesus, actually right before the coming of Jesus, the first time to this earth and study a few things about John the Baptist. And so I invite you to go on an interesting tour with me uh, to examine the story of John the Baptist, the one that was called to prepare the way for the first coming of Jesus. The first thing that I want us to notice is that John the Baptist arose in the midst of a great religious revival. Notice Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Matthew 3, 5 and 6. It says, When Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Notice that there was great expectancy. It says here that Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to John the Baptist. And one of the reasons is because John the Baptist was very similar, as we'll notice in a few minutes, very similar to another prophet of the Old Testament, Elijah. He dressed like Elijah. He ate like Elijah. He lived in the desert like Elijah. He spoke like Elijah. And so there was great expectancy that the Messiah was about to come because it was expected that a forerunner would come which would prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. And by the way, the Jews also knew that a very important prophecy of the Old Testament was about to be fulfilled, the prophecy of the 70 weeks. In other words, the prophecy of the 70 weeks said that after the first 69 weeks, the Messiah would come, the anointed one would come, and they knew that 483 years of that prophecy had just about transpired from the going forth of the word to restore and to build Jerusalem. They could count forward, and they knew that the prophecy of the 70 weeks, the last week, was about to begin. And so because of John the Baptist looking like Elijah, and because this prophecy was about to be fulfilled, there was great expectancy and a great religious revival. Now, John was asked if he was a prophet or if he was the prophet. And I want you to notice what his answer was. John 1, 
verses 19 to 21. John 1, 19 through 21. Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So when they asked John the Baptist if he was the prophet, John the Baptist said, No. So the question is, who was he then? Go with me to Luke chapter 7 and verse 27. If he wasn't the prophet, who was he? Luke 7 verse 27. Here Jesus is speaking and he says, This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send whom? I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. So the question is, what was John the Baptist? He was the Lord's messenger. He said, I am not the prophet, but he was the Lord's messenger. Now, why did God call John the Baptist? Let's read a few verses that tell us the reason why God raised him up. John chapter 1 and verse 23. John 1, 23. He said, this is John the Baptist speaking, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. In other words, he arose in harmony with the fulfillment of a prophecy of Isaiah. And it says that he was called to prepare the way of the Lord. In other words, he was the forerunner of the Messiah to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. Notice Matthew chapter 3 and verses 1 to 3. Matthew 3 verses 1 to 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means the Messiah is about to come because the Jews were expecting the coming of the kingdom. Verse 3, For this is he, speaking about John the Baptist, this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now what does that mean, make his paths straight? Well, in antiquity, when a king was about to arrive, there was a group of individuals who would be sent on the highways and on the roads to make sure that they would remove all of the stones, they would fill in all of the holes so that the king's chariot could come on the road easily and smoothly. So that's what this means. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. In other words, prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. Notice Luke chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Luke 1, 16 and 17. Speaking about John the Baptist, this is before his birth. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Isn't that interesting that he would turn the children of Israel to their God? That must mean that they went astray from their God, right? And notice that his mission is not with the world. His mission is with the church. His mission is with those who claim to serve God. And so it says, And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him. That is, John the Baptist would go before the Messiah in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And notice, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. In other words, to turn around the disobedient so that they would follow the wisdom of the just. And notice the ultimate purpose, to make what? Ready a people prepared for the Lord. What was the role of John the Baptist? It was to prepare a people to receive the Messiah who was about to come so that they would be ready to receive the kingdom. By the way, do you know that John the Baptist was not an innovator? He did not bring new truth, and we're going to look at this in a few moments more extensively. 
He actually was a great restorer. Notice what we find in Matthew chapter 17 and verses 11 through 13. Matthew 17, 11 to 13. John the Baptist was not raised up to bring revolutionary new truths, new doctrines. He was brought to restore that which had been torn down. And by the way, that's why the New Testament calls him Elijah. You remember in the Old Testament what Elijah did when he went to the top of Mount Carmel? It says that he took the stones of the altar of the Lord that were laying all over the place and he built, he rebuilt or he restored the altar of the Lord. In other words, he restored true worship to God. Notice what it says there in verse 11. Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will what? Will restore all things. But I say to you, Elijah has come already. And they did not know him. That means that they rejected him, by the way. They did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. In other words, they mistreated him. Now notice this. It continues saying, Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. See, the Messiah is going to suffer at their hands just like John the Baptist suffered at their hands. And so it continues saying, Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of whom? He spoke to them of John the Baptist. Now folks, this verse is telling us that if they rejected the forerunner, they would also reject the Messiah. If you reject he who prepares the way for the coming of the Messiah, you will eventually also reject the Messiah. Because the word likewise is used. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Now let's notice something else interesting about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was actually more than a prophet. He was not the prophet. He was more than a prophet. Notice Luke chapter 7 and verse 26. Luke 7 and verse 26. Here Jesus is speaking and he says, But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. Let me ask you, was John the Baptist a prophet? He most certainly was a prophet. But he was not a prophet. He was more than a prophet. Remember these details, because we're going to come back to them a little later on in our study. Another interesting thing about John the Baptist is that he did not perform any miracle. Notice John chapter 10, verses 41 and 42. John 10, 41 and 42. It says here, Then many came to him and said, Come to Jesus, that is, John performed no sign. That means no miracle. But all the things that John spoke about this man were true. And many believed in him there. And so you notice that John the Baptist did not perform any sign. He did not perform any miracle, which is a very important detail as we study along. Another interesting thing about John the Baptist is that he had the testimony of Jesus. Notice John chapter 5 and verses 31 to 33. And before we read that passage, I need to make a note of clarification. And that is that in English... We have two words, which is testify and witness. Those two words are the same Greek word. So whenever you find witness or testimony or testify, they are the same Greek word. Now notice John 5, verse 31. Jesus is speaking. He says, if I bear witness, that can be translated testimony. If I bear testimony of myself... My witness or testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness or testimony of me. And I know that the witness or testimony which he witnesses or testifies of me is true. You have sent to John and he has borne witness or testimony to the truth. Do you get the impression that John the Baptist had the testimony of Jesus? He most certainly did. It's translated witness, but it's the same word testimony in English. And so John had the testimony of Jesus because he was raised up to give witness or testimony to Jesus. Now, another interesting detail is that John the Baptist was not the light. Notice John chapter 1, 
verses 6 through 8. John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. It says here, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness. Here's the word again. Came for to testify or for a testimony to testify or bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. Now notice this. He was not that light. Was John the Baptist that light? No, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness. Here's the idea again. He was sent to testify of that light. So the question is, was John Baptist, John the Baptist, the light? No, John the Baptist was not the light. But was John the Baptist a light? He most certainly was. Go with me to John chapter 5 and verse 35. John chapter 5 and verse 35. Here, Jesus is speaking about John the Baptist. And he says, He was the burning and shining what? Lamp. And you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. Did John the Baptist have light? He most certainly did. Was he the light? He was not the light, but he was a light whose purpose was to give witness to the light or to testify about the light. So I guess we could say that John the Baptist was a lesser light whose purpose was to lead to the greater light. And by the way, this is not my surmising. Because let's read verse 35 again and continue with verse 36. It says, He, John, was the burning and shining lamp. And you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But then Jesus says, but I have what? A greater witness than John's. So who was the lesser light? John the Baptist was the lesser light. Who was the greater light? The greater light who gave greater witness was none less than Jesus Christ. In other words, John the Baptist was the lesser light that God raised up to give witness or to testify about the greater light. I'd like to read you a statement from that classic book about Jesus called The Desire of Ages, page 220. The prophet John was the connecting link between the two dispensations. That's between the Old and New Testament. As God's representative, he stood forth to show the relation of the law and the prophets to the Christian dispensation. He was the lesser light, which was to be followed by a greater light. In other words, John the Baptist was a lesser light to lead to the greater light. He was not the light, but he was a light whose purpose was to lead men and women to the greater light. But you know what's interesting as we read John chapter 5, there was another lesser light. You see, John the Baptist was not what we call a canonical prophet. In other words, he's not one of the writers of the scriptures. We don't have a book in the Bible that was written by John the Baptist. Does that make him less of a prophet? Absolutely not. He was still a prophet, even, even though he was not an individual who had a book that forms part of Scripture or part of the Bible. In other words, he was an extra-canonical prophet, if you please. But do you know that there was another lesser light besides John the Baptist that gave witness to the greater light? You say, what was that light? Go with me to John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40. John 5, 39 and 40. Here Jesus is speaking to a group of Jews, and he says, You search the Scriptures. Which scriptures was Jesus talking about here? There was no New Testament. Jesus was still in his ministry. So there was no New Testament written. This is the Old Testament scriptures. So he says, you search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which what? Which testify of me. What did the Old Testament scriptures do? They testified of whom? Jesus. What did John the Baptist do? He testified of whom? Of Jesus. So how many lesser lights do we have? We have two lesser lights that testify to Jesus, the greater light. We have John the Baptist, a non-canonical prophet, and we have the scriptures, which are part of the biblical canon. Notice also John 5, 
verses 45 to 47. John 5, 45 to 47. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. Jesus is speaking. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Whom did Moses write about? He wrote about Jesus. To whom did Moses give testimony or witness? To Jesus. In other words, Moses was a lesser light who was to lead to Jesus the greater light. So we have two lesser lights. John the Baptist, a non-canonical prophet, and we have the scriptures that are part of the biblical canon. And of course, the question that begs to be answered is this. Why did you need two lesser lights to lead to Jesus, the greater light? Why did you need a non-canonical prophet? And why did you need the writings of the biblical canon, canon to give witness to Jesus, the greater light? Wasn't it enough just to have the scriptures as a lesser light to lead to Jesus, the greater light? Let me explain the reason why it was needed to have two lesser lights to lead to Jesus, the greater light. And I want to frame this by asking a question. Do you believe that the Jews could have accepted Jesus simply by reading the scriptures of the Old Testament? Do you think it would have been possible for them to recognize Jesus as the Messiah only by reading the scriptures of the Old Testament, by reading that lesser light? Do you think so? I do. You say, how do you know that? Because every event of the life of Jesus was choreographed in the written scriptures. You have in the material that I gave you a list, and I'm going to go through it quickly. We're not going to read all the verses. The Old Testament said that, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. He would be born of a virgin. His birth would be announced by a star. When he was born, the children would be massacred. He would be called out of Egypt. He would be baptized and anointed at the end of the 69th week of Daniel 9. He would do marvelous and powerful works. He would be a powerful speaker. The Jews would reject his message. They would serve him with their lips while their hearts were far from him. He would march into Jerusalem on a donkey in the midst of great acclamation. He would be cast, he would cast the money changers out of the temple. Zeal for God's house would consume him. He would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. His disciples would forsake him in the garden. He would die a vicarious death. He would say on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His fan, hands and his feet would be pierced. Lots would be cast upon his garments. His heart would be poured out like water. His enemies would spit in his face. His enemies would dare him to come down from the cross. None of his bones would be broken. He would say on the cross, I thirst. He would, his passion would last three days and three nights. He would be buried in the tomb of a rich man. He would resurrect on the third day. He would ascend to heaven and he would sit at the Father's right hand. Was there enough evidence in the written scriptures to show them that Jesus was the Messiah? Absolutely. So could they have just discerned the Messiah by looking at this lesser light, the written scriptures? Absolutely. So the question is, why didn't they discern Jesus, the Messiah, in the written scriptures? The simple reason is that they were living after a period which is called the intertestamental period. It's a period of prophetic silence of 400 years between the book of Malachi and when the jo John the Baptist appeared on the scene. During that period, the people of Israel fell into great darkness. Many wrong teachings, many heresies penetrated Judaism, like keeping the Sabbath legalistically, like the idea of the immortality of the soul, among other things, came in among the Jewish nation, and they were in great darkness. And they read the scriptures as they wished to read them. They wanted the Messiah to come as a glorious king, and that's the way that they read the scriptures of the Old Testament. Notice Matthew chapter 4 and verse 16. It speaks about the, the condition of the people. It says, the people who sat in darkness have seen what? A great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. So what condition were the people in when Jesus came? They were in what? They were in darkness. Notice Luke chapter 1, 
verses 78 and 79. It says here, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring, that is the dawning of the sun, the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit, what? In darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. So were the Jews understanding the Old Testament? No. Were they oblivious to the coming of the Messiah as he was predicted in the Old Testament? Absolutely. So do you know what God did? He says, I'm going to give him a little help. I'm going to raise a non-writing prophet, a non-canonical prophet, that will shine on the pages of the Old Testament so that they can discern the Messiah when he comes. In other words, God is saying, I'm going to help them understand the prophecies of the Old Testament so that they can see the Messiah when he comes. They can understand that this is the Messiah when he comes. In other words, John the Baptist was not raised up to bring new light, but to shine upon the pages of the Old Testament so that they could understand the prophecies that they had misunderstood. His role was to amplify, explain, correct them from the mistakes they had committed in studying the other lesser light, the written scriptures, so that they could discern the Messiah in these prophecies. You see, the people in the days of John the Baptist claimed to be God's people. They professed to be waiting for the Messiah. They professed to love God. And yet these very people would ultimately end up crucifying the Messiah because they misunderstood the Old Testament. So God says, I'm going to raise up John the Baptist to interest them in the study of prophecy. They're going to see this man who dresses like Elijah, eats like Elijah, lives, lives in the desert like Elijah. He talks like Elijah. And maybe that's going to remind them of Malachi chapter Chapter 4, where it says, I'm going to send you Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Maybe this will jog their thought processes and they'll study the prophecies again from the other lesser light, the written scriptures, so that they can understand that the Messiah has come. In other words, he did not come to bring new light. He came to shine upon the light that had already been given. Let me give you an illustration. When I came here to Fresno Central Church, one night I went to a tape room here, and I was, uh, was going to look for a cassette tape, and uh, I went into the room. It was pitch dark. I'd never been in the room, but they told me where the cassettes were. So I went in. The first thing that you do is try and find the light switch so you can turn on the light and find it, you know. So I passed my hand over the wall, and I, for the life of me, I couldn't find any switch anywhere. I looked up. You know, I could kind of see that there was a, a bulb in the ceiling, so I said, there's got to be somewhere to turn the light on. But, you know, in spite of the fact that I looked and looked, I couldn't find it. So finally I gave up. I said, I'm going to go to my office. I'm going to get a flashlight. So I went to the office and I got a flashlight, came to the tape room, turned on the flashlight, and I started flashing the light on the walls. And man, I still couldn't find a switch anywhere. So I said, ah, I've got the flashlight. I'm going to look for the tape. So I went into a cupboard that was uh, just about floor level, and the flashlight uh, veered or turned up just a little bit. And when it turned up, I saw under one of the shelves there, the light switch. Who would have guessed that it would be under a shelf? Who would never think so? And so what do you think that I did? I turned on the greater light. What was the purpose of the flashlight? The purpose of the flashlight was to help me find the switch to the greater light. And that was the purpose of John the Baptist. It was to to shine on the pages of the Old Testament so that the people could discern, so that the people could see the Messiah. For example, you know, when John the Baptist introduced his Jesus, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Boy, that was some revolutionary new truth. Was that a revolutionary new truth? Behold, the Lamb of God? Would people say, I don't see a lamb, I see a man. No. What would they think of? Oh, lambs are sacrificed morning and evening. Isaiah 53 speaks about the lamb taken to the slaughter. The lamb. Yeah. Could this be the lamb that we're expecting? 
In other words, John the Baptist was not bringing any new revolutionary light. What, we, what he was doing was saying, here is the lamb that was predicted in Bible prophecy. Go back to Isaiah. Go back to the sanctuary service and study about the coming of the Messiah. In other words, he's shining upon the pages of the Old Testament so that both of these lights, John the Baptist and the Old Testament, can reveal clearly that Jesus Christ is the expected Messiah. Are you understanding the role of John the Baptist? Not to bring new truth, new doctrines. But unfortunately, the Bible tells us that John the Baptist was rejected by God's own people. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 18 says, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. They even said that he was demon-possessed, God's own people. He was rejected by the leaders, especially. Notice Luke 7, 29 and 30. And when all the people heard him, that is John the Baptist, even the tax collectors justified God. See, the, the problem was not with the common people. So it says, and when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees, by the way, the Pharisees would be the preachers. And lawyers, that would be the theologians today. But the Pharisees and the lawyers, or the preachers and the theologians, rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. And as we read previously, in Matthew chapter 17, verses 12 and 13, it says, Jesus is speaking, but I say to you that Elijah has come already. And they did not know him. That means that they rejected him, by the way. They did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. So let me ask you this. Did the Jews reject the Messiah? They did. Especially the religious leaders? They did. Why did they reject the Messiah? Because if you reject the lesser light, you will reject the greater light. They rejected the scriptures and they rejected John. And therefore, they were not prepared to receive Jesus, the greater light. You see, the Jews, they boasted, they said, we have Moses, we have the Old Testament. But they didn't understand anything of the Old Testament. They were in blindness, they were in darkness. And therefore, God said, I'm going to help them by sending a lesser light to lead them to the greater light. By the way, John the Baptist was not omniscient or infallible. Prophets were human. John the Baptist grew in understanding. John the Baptist, for example, believed that Jesus, that there was only going to be one coming of the Messiah. That the Messiah was going to come. He was going to destroy the wicked. And he was going to reign in, on the throne in Jerusalem. You read his preaching in Matthew chapter 3. It's very obvious that he believed that there was only going to be one coming of the Messiah. And as you continue reading Scripture, you'll notice that when John the Baptist was in prison, uh, he sent some messengers to Jesus, said, now I need to get this straight. This Messiah isn't fitting with my view of the Messiah. So that he sends the message. Uh, are you the one that we're expecting, or are we to expect another? Folks, this is the same John the Baptist that he didn't say, maybe this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin. He said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now he's saying, are you the Messiah or are we to expect another? You see, he did not fully understand all of the implications of Bible prophecy. By the way, when those messengers went to see Jesus, all day Jesus healed the sick, he cast out demons, he did his marvelous works, then he told the disciples, go tell John what you saw. And John finally understood that the Messiah's coming was going to have two stages. But the point is that he grew in his understanding. Was John a false prophet because he did not fully understand from the start? Absolutely not. Was John the Baptist any less of a prophet because he grew in his understanding in the course of time? Absolutely not. He was a true prophet, but he grew in his understanding. And it would be unfair to look at the John the Baptist who preached at the beginning 
and say that that was the same John the Baptist who had developed in his understanding when he finally understood the mission of the Messiah in prison. Now we're going to talk about another prophet. This is an end-time prophet. Interestingly enough, this prophet, whose name is Ellen White, arose also in the midst of a great religious revival. It's known as the Great Second Advent Movement, which took place between 18, in the 1830s through 1844. And do you know that this religious revival was the fulfillment of the same prophecy that, fulfilled, that was fulfilled by John the Baptist when he came and baptized Jesus or anointed the Messiah? Because the 2300-day prophecy, the first part of it is the 70 weeks. The second part of it is the 2300 days. So it's the same identical prophecy, only John the Baptist comes at the end of the first segment. Ellen White rises after the second segment of the same prophecy in the midst of a great religious revival. Ellen White was asked if she was a prophet. Interesting. Do you know what she said? Let me just read. This is in Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 36. She's giving a speech in, the, in Battle Creek, which is a famous Seventh-day Adventist church in Michigan. During the discourse, I said that I did not claim to be a prophetess. Some were surprised at this statement. And as much as being said in regard to it, I will make an explanation. Others have called me a prophetess, but I have never assumed that title. I have not felt that it was my duty to thus designate myself. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 35. She said this, When I was last in Battle Creek, I said before a large congregation that I did not claim to be a prophetess. Twice I referred to this matter, intending each time to make the statement, I do not claim to be a prophetess. If I spoke otherwise than this, let all now understand that what I had in mind to say was that I do not claim the title of prophet or prophetess. So what happened when people ask Ellen White if she was a prophetess? She says, no, I don't claim the title. Is that similar to what happened with John the Baptist? Hmm. So who was Ellen White? Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 34. And I'm telling you what, Ellen White did not sit down to make this parallel that I'm sharing with you today. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 34. Ellen White says, But my work has covered so many lines that I cannot call myself other than what? A messenger sent to bear a message from the Lord to his people and to take up work in any line that he points out. So who was she? The Lord's what? Messenger. Does that ring a bell? Notice Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 32. Early in my youth, I was asked several times, Are you a prophet? I have ever responded, I am the Lord's messenger. I know that many have called me a prophet, but I have made no claim to this title. My Savior declared to me, declared me to be his what? His messenger. So like John the Baptist, she is the messenger of the Lord. By the way, do you know that some people accused Ellen White said she couldn't be a true prophet because she didn't perform miracles? Notice Selected Messages, Volume 2, pages 53 and 54. Some declare their unbelief in the work that the Lord has given me to do because, as they say, Mrs. E.G. White works no miracles. Was there another individual who worked no miracles? John the Baptist. She continues saying, But those who look for miracles as a sign of divine guidance are in grave danger of deception. Did Ellen White have the testimony of Jesus? She most certainly did. By the way, she wrote a series of books called Testimonies for the Church. In fact, she called her writings the Testimonies many times. But not only this, the Bible shows that the end-time church would have the testimony of Jesus Christ, the prophetic gift. You say, how do we know that? Let's notice three verses. Revelation 12, verse 17, that we already looked at at the beginning of our study. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now the question is, 
What is the testimony of Jesus Christ that the remnant has? Revelation 19, verse 10 gives us a definition. It says, And I fell at his feet. John falls at the feet of an angel. I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. What do the brethren of John have? The brethren of John have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is what? The spirit of prophecy. So what is the testimony of Jesus that the end time remnant has? The spirit of prophecy. And John's brothers have the testimony of Jesus. Now we'll go with me to Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw... I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Once again, the same type of scene that we saw in chapter 19, verse 9. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren. What did the brethren have according to Revelation 19, verse 10? The brethren had the what? The testimony of Jesus. But here it says what they are. It says in verse 9, Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, the what? The prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. So what is it to have the testimony of Jesus? It's to be a what? A prophet. So would we expect the end time remnant church to have a prophet? We most certainly would, because the end time church has the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. And the reason why it's called the testimony of Jesus is because that end time prophet, prophet is going to give witness to Jesus. That end time prophet is going to give testimony about Jesus. By the way, do you know that Ellen White also, even though she did not claim to be a prophet, she says, my work is greater than the work of a prophet. Notice Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 32. My work includes much more than the word prophet signifies. On page 36, she says, My commission embraces the work of a prophet, but it does not end there. It embraces much more than the minds of those who have been sowing the seeds of unbelief can comprehend. And on page 36, she says, my work includes much more than this name signifies. I regard myself as a messenger entrusted by the Lord with messages for his people. So even though she did not claim to be a prophet, she was greater than a prophet. Do you know why? Because John the Baptist was to join or unite the Old Testament period with the New Testament period. The role of Ellen White was to create the link between this dispensation and the coming of the kingdom of Jesus Christ at his second coming. In other words, as John the Baptist was to prepare people for the first coming of Jesus, Ellen White was raised up to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus. And both stand at the turning point of a dispensation. John the Baptist between the Old and New Testament, Ellen White between the New Testament and the coming kingdom. By the way, do you know that Ellen White also referred to herself as a lesser light? Notice Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 30. She says, Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to what? To the greater light. And some people have mistakenly assumed that Ellen White is saying here that the Bible is the greater light, and she's a little lesser light that was raised up to you know, give light, it show people the greater light, which is the Bible. But what she's saying is that people ignored the Bible just like the Jews ignored the Scriptures. And God raised her up to shine upon the pages of the Bible so that they could see Jesus Christ in Old and New Testament. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Some people might ask, Pastor, why do you have two smaller lights at the end of time? Why do you have a canonical source of light, which is the scriptures, and a non-canonical prophet whose writings are not in scripture. Why would you need to have two lesser lights? 
Isn't it enough just to have the scriptures, the, that one lesser light that leads to Jesus, the greater light? Let me explain the reason why. You see, just like the intertestamental period brought darkness into the Jewish nation, so the Middle Ages, known as the Dark Ages, brought darkness into the Christian church. Many counterfeit doctrines, false doctrines, like the idea that Sunday is the day that we're supposed to worship, the immortality of the soul, and many other kindred doctrines, the idea of an eternally burning hell. All of these things were brought into the Christian church. Darkness came into the Christian church. And so what God did was raise up Ellen White to shine on the pages of the Bible so that as she shone on the pages of the, pages of the Bible, the truth could be recovered and people could see the fullness of truth. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Was she raised up to bring new light? Was she raised up to bring new revolutionary doctrines that no one had ever heard before? Absolutely not. She was to rescue, to restore that which had been buried and had been forgotten by the Christian world so that people could see Jesus once again in the teachings of the Bible. Do you know that Ellen White herself says that if people had paid attention to the Bible, God would have never raised her up? Let me ask you, if the Jews had discerned Jesus in the Old Testament, do you think God would have raised up John the Baptist? If they'd seen all that the Messiah was going to do, and when Jesus came, they would have received him with open arms, would God have raised up John the Baptist? No purpose. Would God have raised up Ellen G. White if the Christian world was practicing the truth and believing what the Bible teaches? Absolutely not. In fact, notice, Ellen White had something very interesting to say about her writings. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, pages 664 and 665, she says this, speaking to an individual, you are not familiar with the scriptures. If you had made God's word your study with a desire to reach the Bible standard and attain to Christian perfection, you would not have needed the testimonies. Is the Bible sufficient? Would the Bible have been sufficient? Yes. Why did God raise her up? Because he wanted people to understand the Bible, people who were in darkness. You know, would you be critical of that, that God wants to give a helping hand to the Christian world so that they can truly understand what the Bible contains? She continues saying, it is because you have neglected to acquaint yourselves with God's inspired book, see, because you've neglected to study the Bible, that he has sought to reach you by simple, direct testimonies, calling your attention to the words of inspiration which you had neglected to obey and urging you to fashion your lives in accordance with its pure and elevated teachings. Where did Ellen White direct people? To the Bible. Notice what she continues saying. The, the Lord designs to warn you, to reprove, to counsel through testimonies given and to impress your minds, listen to this, with the importance of the truth of his word. The written testimonies are not to give new light. Is that clear? But to impress vividly upon the hearts the truths of inspiration already revealed. Man's duty to God and to his fellow man has been distinctly specified in God's word. Yet, but few of you are obedient to the light given. Additional truth is not brought out. She's talking about her writings. But God has, through the testimonies, simplified the great truths already given and in his own chosen way brought them before the people to awaken and impress the mind with them that all may be left without excuse. Does she have it straight? Just like John the Baptist. Not to bring new light, not to bring new doctrines, but to lead people to once again understand the light that is given in Scripture so that through both a clear discernment can be gained of Jesus Christ. Just to give you an illustration. A few years ago, I was preaching in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was listening to a radio talk show. And uh, this individual, not a Seventh-day Adventist, he was answering questions, and this individual called and he said, Sir, I have two questions. My first Bible question is, is it a sin to smoke? And the second question is, uh, is God going to send me to hell for smoking? 
And he said, I'll hang up and take the answer on the air. Now, I was very amazed by the questions, but I was even more amazed by the answers. This minister who was answering the question says, well, with regard to your first question, I can assure you that smoking isn't a sin because you don't find a text in the Bible that says, thou shalt not smoke. <laughs> and he said, with regards to your second question, whether God is going to send you to hell for smoking, no, to the contrary, you might make it to heaven quicker because he believed that the man's soul was immortal. And if he dies quicker, he'll go to heaven quicker. This was a Christian minister answering questions on the air. Now let me ask you, is there a text in the Bible that says thou shalt not smoke? No, there isn't. But is there, are there texts in Scripture that forbid smoking? Yes, the Bible says thou shalt not kill quickly. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says thou shalt not kill. Whether you kill slowly with a cigarette or whether you kill quickly with a gun makes no difference. Both are killing. It's violating the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Besides, the Bible says that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that Ellen White says that it's a sin to smoke? Because it violates the temple of God. So is she really adding to Scripture? She's not adding anything to Scripture. What she's doing is she's taking the principles and she's amplifying Scripture. Her writings are like a telescope. Let me ask you, when an individual, when an astronomer looks through a telescope at the stars, does he see stars that you don't see with your simple eyesight? Yes. So the telescope is creating those stars. The telescope is inventing those stars. Are those stars out there? What is the purpose of the telescope? To create new stars or to help us see the stars that are already there? It's for us to see the stars that are already there. Ellen White's writings are like a telescope. If we had spiritual discernment, we wouldn't need the telescope. But because the Christian world is so messed up in its belief system, especially about prophecy, God says, I'm going to raise up a prophet and I'm going to help them along so that they can come back to the teachings of the scriptures. Let me give you, in closing, a parallel that will help you understand what I'm saying. How many of you have ever received a visit from uh, a Mormon from a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I see several hands going up. By the way, they're good people. You know, they have very high family principles. They also have very good health principles. Sometimes they have better health principles than we do as Seventh-day Adventists, sad to say. And they're more family-focused many times than we are. But having said that, uh, when they come uh, to the home, if they've been to your house, they've been to my house several times, what is the first thing that they want uh, to teach you when they come to your house? What is the first study that they give you? The whole history of what? Of the Book of Mormon. How, you know, Joseph Smith, Smith found the golden plates and how Moroni, uh, you know, um, actually translated these golden plates that were in ancient Egyptian and how Joseph Smith translated them and the result is the Book of Mormon. That's their first Bible study, the whole history of the Mormon church. And the history of the, of the Mormon uh, book, which is, uh, you know, called Another Testimony, Another Testament of Jesus Christ. You've seen the advertisements on television. Why do they want to give you the Bible study on the Book of Mormon first? Let me explain why. Because many of their doctrines they cannot prove from the Bible. So the first thing that they have to do is convince you that the Book of Mormon is as inspired of, of, as the Bible and as reliable as the Bible. So that then in the Bible studies from then on, they can use not only the Bible, but also the Book of Mormon. In other words, for them, the Book of Mormon, listen, supplements Scripture. It does not complement Scripture. It supplements Scripture. It has many truths that are not contained in Scripture, according to them. The whole history of the, of the Native Americans, they say, is in there and not in the Bible. So they have to convince you that the Book of Mormon is as reliable as the Bible. Do you know Seventh-day Adventists do it just the other way around? When we give a series of Bible studies or a series of evangelistic meetings, we go through the Bible point by point. State of the dead, Sabbath, the law, grace, God's grace, healthful living, baptism, you name it. We go through what the Bible has to say. And then when we get to the end, and I hope that we do this, when we get to the end, we say, oh, by the way, 
we also have a prophet. You notice that we haven't gotten any of our teachings from the prophet, all from the Bible. But the prophet amplifies and helps us understand what is contained in Scripture, and it ex it's explained in a beautiful way. Are you understanding the difference? Ellen White was raised up by God to be an end-time John the Baptist, to prepare God's people in every sphere of life, health, publishing, education, spiritual life, institutions, you name it, to prepare people in all of the areas of life to be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ in power and glory. Just like John the Baptist was raised up to prepare people for the first coming of Jesus, and I'm sad to say that many, even within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, are criticizing Ellen White. Books like The White Lie, all kinds of Internet sites that basically uh, trash the writings of Ellen White with vitriolic hatred. Do you know, I learned something long ago, and that is you don't get your concept of someone or of a church from their friends or from their enemies. You don't get your concept of a church from the enemies of that church because they're going to make matters worse than they really are. And you don't get uh, your concept from their friends because they're going to make the church look better than it really is. What you do is you go and you check it out for yourself. You don't go to the Internet sites or to books written about Ellen White. You go to the source itself. And by the way, Ellen White was not infallible. She was not omniscient. She grew in her understanding. If you want to see this, just compare early writings in the book, The Great Controversy. She grew in her ability of describing truth. And so God has given this marvelous message to the Seventh-day Adventist Church for us to share to the world. And I pray to God that we will appreciate it and share it like the leaves of autumn.